So thank you very much, Samina, for the great introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I have um, Samina and I met in Bangkok at a conference organized by IFPRI. She will always remember that conference because they're, they're, they produced the wrong slides for her. Uh, so I was getting a little bit nervous when my, my computer was not behaving here and I wasn't sure I was going to have my right slides, but it looks like I do. Uh, so thank you for, for the very nice introduction and for inviting me. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. And what I will be talking about today is this program that um, I have been leading. Um, and just as, as a matter of little introduction, IFPRI has four divisions, uh, research divisions. We do research on, on policies in, in the area of agriculture and food policies. Um, and I, I, had, I, I lead the uh, Poverty, Health and Nutrition Division, uh, but we have uh, other divisions that work on markets and trade and, and divisions that work on, on product, the production side. And this particular program was a challenge for me because I was asked to bring in people from all four divisions at IFPRI and making it a, a proposal that was a lot more encompassing than just my area, my comfort zone. And so. Uh, I think it, it brings in uh, economics and nutrition and, and gender and, and other issues that are all very le relevant for the topic. Uh, but we've assembled a great uh, team of, of IFPRI uh, researchers and so I'll do my best to represent the program. Uh, but you will sense that there will be a little bit more of a nutrition focus than if anybody else had IFPRI was to present that. Um, so the outline of my presentation, I will start with just talking about urbanization and the changing nature of malnutrition, uh, urban diets and the nutrition transition. I don't know if those terms are all familiar. I'll try to keep you along with, with explaining what I'm talking about here. Why are urban diets changing? Um, and it's a combination of changing demand and changing supply factors. And I will introduce the, our research agenda because one of the reasons for my visit is really to look at partners here, to look at how we could partner on this uh, new program. We're, we're just starting, we're raising money for it, and uh, I know that you all are doing a, a lot of very interesting work, and, and I think we have lots of things we could collaborate on. So I'll provide a little bit of introduction. You probably all know that urbanization is, is, uh, has been happening very fast, and it will continue to uh, happened fast until 2050 at least. Those are the projections. Right now we have about half or a little more than half of the population lives in urban areas. It's expected to go to 68 percent by 2050. Um, and most of this growth will happen in Asia and in Africa. They will put on an, an additional 2.6 billion people uh, in, in urban areas. So 90 percent of the growth will, will happen there. At the same time as we, as we have these processes, we have multiple forms of malnutrition. It used to be that I was working on undernutrition. I was working with uh, issues related to children being stunted, wasted. So stunted is the short children that you see there. Wasted are the ones that are thin and that are at very high risk of mortality. Uh, but now we also have problems of overweight and obesity in children in developing countries that is, that is starting and we have very stubborn problems of, of micronutrient deficiencies. But we also have in the, the low and middle income countries where we work a lot of obesity among adults. And while we still have some, a lot of women, for example, in South Asia are still underweight uh, and, and their, their overweight and obesity leads to non-communicable diseases and they also have problems of micronutrient deficiency. So we no longer live in a world where you can say, I'm going to focus on stunting, which I did for a large proportion of my life because stunting is a good indicator of overall poverty and malnutrition. Now I need to make sure that we don't uh, do any harm when we target interventions to, to, to deal with undernutrition by making them more overweight or at risk of overweight and obesity. So the world has changed for us a lot and we now need to consider all forms of malnutrition in our work. This is also happening, these multiple forms of, of malnutrition, you might have heard about the double uh, burden of malnutrition. Some people call it the double burden. It's not double, there are multiple burdens, but we still uh, call it that. And we see that happening at the level of, of countries. It, it complicates a lot, as I mentioned, what we are to do to prevent both, all forms of malnutrition. 
It happens at the level of communities. It happens at, at the level of households. You can see on the right side on the top that there is this obese woman who has a child that could be micronutrient deficient or maybe thin or maybe stunted. Uh, and so it happens at the level of the household wh where you have multiple burdens and it also happens at the level of an individual. You, ha you have a five-year-old there who is overweight in Tanzania. That's unusual and that child is most likely to be micronutrient deficient at the same time. So again, this is what the new reality of nutrition that we have to face. So now, um, or in terms of urban malnutrition, when you think of, uh, it used to be again that it, uh, children were less malnourished in urban areas and more malnourished in, in rural areas, and so we were always assuming that urban areas were not that important because there's not so much undernutrition. Uh, well, on average, there isn't. Uh, on average, urban areas are, are usually doing a little bit better in terms of childhood malnutrition and also maternal malnutrition, undernutrition. But that, that is starting to shift because people are moving to urban areas and, and, uh, and there they bring in their poverty and, and their past as, as being malnourished. Um, and we can see that the urban share of stunting, or, or yeah, of stunting in particular, has increased from 23% to 31% now. Um, micronutrient deficiencies, we don't have any data, but we know there are deficiencies because we know that the diets are not ideal. And there are more problems of overweight and obesity in urban areas. It always starts there. In the low and middle income countries, the problem always starts in urban areas, and we'll talk about why. And as I mentioned, the, uh, the average may look like there is less uh, undernutrition in urban areas, but we know there are large inequalities in urban areas, and therefore the poorest of the poor, and we've shown that in some of our studies, the poorest of the poor in urban areas are often as bad as some of the, of the rural poor, or even as the poor of the poor in, in rural areas. These are data from um, India where we're looking at also how the, the, the patterns of malnutrition have changed over time. And um, I'm going to try to do the Yes, OK. So you have the three bars here. You have, you have girls and boys, women and men. And so those are children and those are adults. And, and the top um, here is um, looking at stunting and un underweight in adults. So stunting in children and underweight in adults. And you can see three, three curves. The rural is on top. And, and the urban slum is, is in the middle, and the bottom one is the urban non-slums. So you can see that there's always more malnutrition, undernutrition in, in rural areas when you look at undernutrition. You can see also marked improvements. Uh, congratulations to India. Marks improvements and reductions of stunting and of maternal underweight from 2006-2016. When you look at the bottom part, you see the reverse. And, and in children, there isn't a lot of overweight and obesity, and it's not markedly different between the zones, uh, the areas. But in women, you see the exact reverse pattern, that women that in, in urban areas have been becoming more overweight and obese. Uh, the urban non-slums are here, and then the ur followed by the urban slums, and then the rural areas. And so, you can see a rapid increase in 10 years in overweight and obesity in, in adult women, and, and both actually, not just adult women, but adult men and women. And what that does is if you look at here again, India, women, you have uh, this proportion that is underweight in urban slums and this proportion that is overweight, with a total of about half women have a problem of either underweight or, or overweight. Again, this really complicates how we address the problems of malnutrition. Here, just to show uh, another example, this is uh, West Africa, where really poverty is at a whole other level, and, and you would not think that you would see so much overweight and obesity as what you see here. So those are, are again, adults, and uh, you can see that with increasing income, there are, in urban areas, a very rapid increase in overweight and obesity. There is also an alarmingly fast increase in, in, urban er in rural areas uh, as income increases. So income can be bad news, unfortunately. Rises in income are often associated with rapid rises in, in overweight and obesity. And you can see that the, the effect on, on reducing underweight, undernutrition, is much slower than the effect on rising 
overweight and obesity. This is not the first time we see that, that just it's so easy to get populations to become overweight. So why are they overweight? Why do we have these problems? Uh, why are they not just overweight, but why are they malnourished? And diets, poor diets are at the center of all forms of malnutrition. This is uh, very easy to understand. Um, I wanted to put this slide because there's this, uh, this uh, journalist, uh, Thin Nguyen, who uh, wrote a paper, or who wrote a, a piece on death by diet. So poor diets have become now, for the first time, the, 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 mo the world's most killer. Basically responsible, the, the one uh, factor that is responsible for 11 million premature deaths uh, are attributable to diets, poor diets. So they look at, uh, this is a global burden of diseases, uh, you probably know ab about their work. So they look at the whole world and they look at the determinants of premature mortality and the determinants of, of, um, of uh, DALIs as well. And what they find in the, re in the most recent one is that there are 15 dietary factors that are, that are responsible for one in five deaths premature deaths, and that's 11 million people. You can see where the concentration is red, is where this is happening. Um, people in these, in these countries die more. We have to recognize that they die more. They're more likely to die of chronic diseases because there is not good ser health services. Uh, and so, you know, in the U.S., it's not that people don't have these chronic diseases, but they're, they're just not dying as much. But in these, in these countries where uh, they're not used to have so much chronic diseases, they don't, de they don't get detected, they don't get treated, and, and so mortality is, is very, very high. That's the example of the 15 factors. I don't want to go into details here, but just so you know that they're talking here about diets that are low in certain foods, fruit, vegetables, whole grains we know are good for you, the calcium, the fiber, are all good things. And on the right side, what are the, the, the factors? Are red meat consumption, highly processed meat, and, and highly processed foods as well. Sugar sweetened beverages are one very high risk factors in some developing countries, trans fatty acids, sodium. So that's the, the, the analysis that they, that they have done. Here what I wanted to show is that we refer to the fact that the low and middle income countries have been undergoing a nutrition transition. This is not new. Barry Popkin started to talk about that many, I mean at least two decades ago there was a nutrition transition happening, and it's happening faster than ever, and it happens in terms of a, a, a transition from traditional to modern meals, from traditional to modern snacking, and from traditional to modern food marketing. So all of this is happening at the same time. So the result is that people are adding, are eating a lot of added sugar, in, in uh, eating a lot more pastries and, and um, uh, sweetened beverages, packaged food that contain a lot of sugar and salt and fat. Uh, in low and middle income countries, you'll see that a lot of the street food is, is fried. So they're, they're eating what they used to eat, not fried, and now they're, they're throwing that in oil and, and there's a lot of fat in their diet and saturated fat. Animal source foods are increasing as their income increases, they, the demand for animal source food increases. Um, ultra processed foods, so I'll talk quite a bit about ultra processed food and what we mean here are packaged foods that are over and over and over processed and contain very little remnants of food. They're basically plastic or, or some other uh, form of non-food. They contain some ingredients of food but a lot of chemicals and a lot of colorings and, and things like that. And there's also a lot more eating out and eating of convenience food away from home. People um, uh, people eat pre-cooked um, foods and meals a lot more and all of that is not, we're not talking about the U.S. here, just low, low and middle income countries and this is uh, happening very rapidly, especially in, in, in Asia and in South Asia it has happened rapidly and it's going to happen in the next decade very fast in Africa as well. The industry knows how to invade and, and, and they will do the same in Africa very soon. Uh, because depending on who you talk to, people in Africa will say, no, not everybody eats out, not everybody eats, uh, you know, all of these uh, more modern foods and, and purchase in supermarkets. Well, they don't yet, but they will in 10 years, and, and, and I can guarantee you. 
the snacking, uh, there is evidence that snacking is about, constitute about 22% of energy intake of people because people snack and don't, don't substitute. They, they eat just more. I mean, I snack all the time, but I don't eat a lot. I don't eat more because I snack. I eat small amounts at the same time. But the snacking in general, especially when you put in all of the sodas and these sugar um, things, happen to be in addition to your normal diet. So too many calories. Uh, and there's been decreases in, in the, the, the traditional uh, foods. Uh, legumes, vegetable fruits, whole grains have, have gone down and, and there is also a, lot, a big decrease in the food preparation at home and the time spent in cooking. So why are diets changing? So there are, and, and we're talking about urban areas here, as income rises, people, people are more attracted to, to purchasing different types of foods. Um, employment away from home. Women in urban areas are much, much more likely than in rural area to work away from home for very long hours and to not be able to take their child to, to, to their place of work. Whereas in rural areas, they carry the child and, and they're in, still in charge of the child the whole day, not in urban areas. And, and sometimes they commute for many hours and end up being away for 12, 14 hours. So they don't have time to cook. They need access to facilities as well. In urban slums, if you've visited urban slums, there are families that live in a one room, five people in one room, no cooking facilities, nothing. Um, they may have a fridge, they may not, and they certainly don't have all the equipped kitchen. Uh, so they purchase out, they, they buy from informal farmers and, and they buy from fast food restaurants or, or from little shops. Um, there's also in urban areas a lot gra a greater exposure to food marketing and advertising that you see in supermarkets. They're more likely to have supermarkets, modern retail stores, and, and have all of this bombard being bombarded by what they should eat and buy, and, and those are usually the processed foods. Uh, and they have more sedentary lifestyle. I didn't mean to do that. They have more sedentary lifestyles, which means that they should eat differently because they don't spend as much en energy as they used to, but they don't. They, we can see that it, they're, they're becoming obese. So there is also that element that I just wanted to mention is the change in physical activity that ends up with having an imbalance in the energy you spend and the energy you, you consume. And um, here are data from China from Barry Popkin that shows the blue, the blue part of, of the graph shows the reduction in physical, physical activity related to work. So people have more sedentary jobs. We know that when you move to, area, to urban areas, it happens a lot. And this is the number of hours of sedentary, uh, just, just being sedentary during the day. And so it's dramatic change. And again, I think the diets have not responded adequately to the need for less energy. So we have a, a real problem. Um, there are obviously a lot of supply factors that are responsible for the changes in the diets. Uh, globalization, I, I've mentioned that uh, in passing, but that's, that's Africa now. I, it's actually, this is probably Mozambique, I think it's in, in Portuguese. Uh, but that, that was not the situation 10 years ago of having big supermarkets with all the marketing there and this incredible diversity in foods and in in food outlets and places where to eat. Um, and the, again, the, a lot of the, the attractive uh, processed food are often cheaper than healthy diets. So people are uh, just trying to get by with the budgets they have. And if they find all these prepared meals for cheaper than if they were cooking them from scratch, they go for these things. Uh, so the food, the food the environments is really ch changing. Uh, the food environments around people, what they have access to is really changing very fast. The price of these food, as I said, is, is changing fast. Uh, so they have a, a mix of access to more diversity of, of healthy foods and of unhealthy foods. Uh, and they have a range of options when it comes to eating out and, and uh, going to fast food restaurants. And, they, and they're exposed to all the, the aggressive food marketing and, and advertising. So here, just to support some of the things I was saying, uh, if you look here at the rural versus the urban and where they procure their food and what kind of foods they procure, the, the, the few points I wanted to make here is that, and, and that is by increase in income. So 
the poor in rural areas uh, produce up to 60% of their food. And so they buy some things, but they, they mostly consume what they produce. And that goes down. As income increases in rural areas, they produce less. And uh, as income increases, they produce less and they consume more of, the, they, they pr purchase more. And they, you can see here, this is the processed food. Um, and you can see that in rural areas, they already do eat quite a bit of these highly processed food. Whereas in urban areas, of course, there is no, not a lot of production. This is the green bars on, on the urban side. There's really not a, a lot of own production, but there's some, and, and it's the, uh, the poor that have some, that find some ways of, of cultivating around their home or something. But then if you look at the, um, uh, at what happens with income, as, uh, well, as income increases, how much, again, the steep curve of how much they consume these they purchase these, these highly processed food. So that's just an illustration of, you know, I just want to make sure that this is not just my talking. The, there are data that really support these things. Um, there are changes in food consumption also at the national level. So here countries are grouped into different uh, socioeconomic groups from lower to higher income for, uh, at the level of, of countries. And so those are very global data where uh, you see that patterns of food consumption at different food change as income changes. So for example, when, when countries have greater income, you can see positive impacts on increases in fruit consumption, in dairy consumption, not, it, it says milk, but it really is dairy and the cheese is responsible for a lot of that. Um, and then, and then uh, the, the, the inevitable increase in red meat consumption. And at the other end of, of the spectrum, you see that there's decreases in vegetable consumption. This is really bad and, and very surprising, actually. And there's some decrease in fiber as well, which we know because people eat the more processed food. So uh, there are good and bad things, as I mentioned, when, when, uh, with it, that happen with income, and especially when there, there are uh, knowledge estimators, when people don't have the information about what's a healthy diet, then they, their tendency is, is to go for uh, what's cheaper and what's more convenient. This is uh, uh, information from Euromonitor, which uh, provides sales data. You can get data on sales of, and, and here we have data on sales of all of these uh, snacks, uh, snack foods, and what, what's important to look at is how this has changed over time. This is China, and you can see since 2005, I think, how much the sale of these products has changed. This is uh, uh, entirely countries from Asia, but there, there really has been a, a rapid change in, in, uh, in the sale of these products, and you can see India is, is here and is, is just slowly getting there. Um, so the reason why I, I, I insist a lot on, on the problems with the ultra-processed foods, and I'm, I'm seeing more and more information on actually how bad they are, um, is uh, so I want to just justify a little bit my obsession with those. Um, so here you have WHO who recommends that 10% of our energy intake sh should come from, from sugar, not more than that, from uh, added sugars. Uh, and not more than that. And here what you have is the proportion of your energy intake that comes from ultra-processed food. So what happens when the more ultra-processed food you eat, the more sugar you consume without actually knowing it, and, there's a, and, and you're way above the, the WHO recommendation. The contrary for, for uh, percent of energy from protein goes way down as you consume more of those. So those products don't usually uh, provide a lot of, of protein, the, you can be sure that the industry will fix that. They can add protein. That's not a problem. They hadn't thought about it. But if we tell them we really have a problem, then they'll, they'll just start adding it and claim that it's healthy for you. Um, oh, that's the wrong slide. That's weird. Okay. Something happened. Um, this was showing a relationship with obesity and consumption of those uh, foods, and it's not there. Uh, but overall, what I'm finding, and, and, and really those are very recent um, studies, is that there's a, a, an interesting article that just came out, and it, it, it makes a, a review of what's up with the, with the, the, the concern over, over highly processed food. And they are associated with poor dietary quality, as I mentioned, 
higher risk of cardiovascular diseases, obesity, metabolic syndrome, all causes of mortality and cancer. So that's a big issue. And the biggest concern, as I said, is that it will invade Africa. Now that it's, it's done well with, uh, with Asia, it will come to Africa as well. And, and that's, that's really a scary thing. Uh, here, this is work that our team has done on the cost. I, I have mentioned that often these foods that are less healthy are the, the, are the cheapest ones. And what this is, it's kind of a, um, how do you call those uh, hot maps? Not hot maps. Um, anyway, it, it, it's a uh, hot spot, whatever it is, heat maps, heat maps. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was just wondering, what am I saying? Okay, so here you have uh, the relative cost per calorie of different types of foods by, uh, compared to the staple in a given country. So the staple food uh, will, have, will be of a certain price per calorie. And what they compared was the price of, for example, eggs and milk. And uh, I can't read what this one is. Um, fruit and, uh, it's not even a rich, rich fruit. So you have three healthy products here. Uh, that, uh, and, and the red circles here mean that they're very expensive. They're 11 times more expensive than one calorie from Staples in Africa. Um, whereas, and so you see Africa has very, very high prices for food. Uh, anything fresh here, and then this was a fortified cereals for kids, but they shouldn't use anyway. And then uh, these are sweets and the, the, the soda. And you can see that the sweet are not expensive anywhere, the pastries. The soda is generally not expensive, except in Africa and, and, and in some other places. But generally speaking, there is really uh, a, an incredible difference in the price, for example, of eggs, a simple food. 11, it's 11 times more expensive than the, the, per calorie than the staple food in, in Africa. Uh, and, and in Asia, it's also many times higher. So there is a problem for people to acquire those fresh foods, and, and, and there are reasons why they don't consume them. In sub-Saharan Africa, egg calories are 11 times as expensive as a, a calorie from staple food, and sugary snacks are only three times as expensive. And they give all the calories that the kids need, and, and they make them happy. Um, so in, in, uh, in conclusion for all of my, my very long introduction is that uh, for the urban poor, very often the most accessible and affordable and convenient foods for them are the most unhealthy. And, and having a healthy, a healthy diet is actually not accessible. So that's, that's of concern. So again, wrong picture. Oh, funny. Um, this is a picture of a, a school food environment, but this is not what, it, what was supposed to be there. I was, uh, I was uh, interested in showing the, the brochure that we have on our, on our program that I mentioned before. So this is just now I'm going to introduce this program to see what, to see, uh, so that you see what we're working on developing and, and uh, what are the kinds of research questions we're looking at. So the overall goal is a very long sentence. But we want to generate evidence and, analy and analytical tools to guide policymakers and other key actors in designing and implementing effective food systems uh, policies to support healthier diets and optimal nutrition and health. Long, long title, but you see that we're focusing on urbanization at, as it relates to diet, nutrition, and health. Um, so we use a conceptual framework of food systems, which uh, is uh, inspired from GLOPAN, the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition, uh, where basically food systems are, are around our food environments. At the, at the center of, of this graph is healthy diets and, and the urban poor. For us, this is the center of our universe. And how, what influences their diet is their, is their preferences, and they, there are a lot of factors at the consumer level. And, and then there are factors at the food environment level, and that's what we want to understand. We, we feel that we have all these conceptual frameworks. We, we, we really seem or we think we understand how this works, but actually we don't have data uh, in, in terms of understanding 
what are of those factors at the food environment level and at the consumer level, what are the factors that are most important and drive people into bad diets or into unhealthy diets? So in terms of food environment, what we mean is, is what's the food that's available? What does it look like? What does it taste like? What are the prices of these foods? What is the food safety of these foods? And what are the policies and the regulations that exist? So some foods are promoted more than others, and usually the ones that are promoted are not the best one for you. Th there's marketing, there's labeling, uh, and, and there's issues of taxation. So th those policies affect the choices that people make, and we'd like to understand better uh, how they play into, uh, into the equation. Um, here we have uh, the five buckets of, of research uh, that we will be working on. So we'll work on, on understanding food environments, diets, nutrition, and health, how these things relate. We're going to work on urban-rural linkages, how urban food systems can be leveraged to have a, a more uh, effective urban, to, to strengthen the urban-rural link linkages. We're going to look at supermarkets, in particular, deep dive into supermarkets, because they are the enemy. They're considered the enemy now in, 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 in the developing world, and we're thinking they, they're not just an enemy. We could work with them also, hopefully, possibly, to uh, make them a driver of, of more positive changes in nutrition. And we're also interested in peri-urban and urban agriculture. So from here on, I'll just talk about some of the broad research questions in these areas that we're interested in. And again, to uh, just see where uh, maybe you might be interested as well. So in terms of the food environment, um, as I said, we, we, understand the concept, the, we understand conceptually what should affect the, the, the diets of people, but we don't understand the relative contribution of different factors. Uh, and, and so we're interested in knowing also in places where there are certain types of policies that are implemented, what are the policies that work, what things can be done to influence people's uh, diets, Ob obviously there are, there's the supply side and there's the knowledge and, and demand side. People uh, m might need to be better educated about food in order to have healthier foods. And um, on the right side, I just wanted to highlight that yes, food environments around school are very important and, there, and there's a lot happening inside the school, through the, f the school meals, as well as outside the vendors. And in a lot of countries, there are vendors outside that are just waiting for those kids who have uh, the, the few pennies to spend, and they, and they, send, um, they sell them on healthy foods. I wanted to highlight when I talk about health claims, this is a picture of a type of cookie that they sell everywhere in India. You know those cookies. And I don't know if you can read. But here it says G for genius. So those cookies will make your children genius. So that's really a, an incredible health claim. Another one here is about the uh, Jesus is the light for the light. This, this is in Ghana. Um, it's kind of, uh, it, it's certainly interesting what they claim here. Um, there's, uh, there's also other types of, when I was talking about, uh, see the food labeling is not there. Um, there was, I, I, I don't know what happened with this, the shifting. Here on food labeling, I had a picture of the, the Chile intervention, very massive intervention in, in, in putting big labels on their food. And you have the um, sucaritas, it's, it's called in Spanish, the corn, the, the corn flakes, sweetened corn flakes? What is it called? Uh, sugar? Anyway, that corn flake, that sugar corn flakes, has a, 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 a bear on it, <laughs> Tony the bear. And so in Chile, they have eliminated Tony from, from the, the, the boxes. And they also have very big warning signs of, you know, red mean, black, I think, means that it's really too high in, salt, too, too high in sugar, too high in calories. Or, so they have a system, a traffic light system, for informing people but not just the fine print, really the big signals. And, and the, the, tiggy, the bear, uh, Tony the bear having disappeared was also to not attract the, the attention of children and all that. So there are things that are happening, but we don't really know their impact. The, the taxation in, in, um, uh, of, of soda in Mexico and many countries in Latin America has been documented quite a bit. 
and it has an impact on reduction, at least in Mexico, in reducing the consumption of soda, but it took them 14 years to get to this taxation. People think it's not high enough, they should, they should have a tax that is even higher, and it was hard enough to get there, and then we don't know if at the end of the day it actually has an impact on their overall diets, are they substitute, what are they substituting with. And so it's, it's a whole area that of, the, of the policies and regulations that we're very interested in looking at more carefully. Um, in terms of um, urban food systems, uh, I will go fast here. It's, uh, it's uh, here where we're thinking in terms of urban-rural linkages and how the changing demand in urban areas might create an opportunity for small farmers, for especially those that are uh, working on highly perishable foods and that are working in, in, uh, in peri-urban areas or very close to the city. So the whole <coughs> production and processing of fruit and vegetables, of dairy and, and all of those things could be strengthened so that basically those small farmers that are left behind many often and many times could actually be brought in to contribute and, and, uh, and to be part of, of the economic growth that happens as a result of this changing demand in, in, uh, in urban areas. And so we're interested in looking at the types of policies that can help foster both healthy diets of, of the consumers and inclusive growth overall. Supermarkets, I mentioned that we're interested in understanding uh, the pricing behavior among other things. Uh, people, st certainly in Africa, people still tend to, con to buy their fruit and vegetables from the wet market and buy their, all their dry foods and processed food from the supermarkets, in spite of the fact that supermarkets often offer as well those products. Is it, do they still buy from the fresh market because they, they think it's more attractive or it's cheaper? Or So we need to understand um, what drives their consumption, their, their decision, their, their procurement patterns. And we also need to understand what can be done at the level of those supermarkets to make them not, again, be the enemy in terms of their bad practices and their bad advertising, but on the contrary, being uh, part of the solution. Um, the informal, informal markets is extremely important and interesting to us because there's a lot of issues with the governance of that, of that sector. But at the same time, people rely on it, depend on it, and, and there are certain countries where it's even more uh, prominent that Ghana is a good example where there's so much street food consumption. And we don't know if the food is safe. We actually know very often that they don't have what they need to make it safe. And one thing that has really not been looked at is what's the nutritional value of these foods. I do think that they may be part of the problem with too many calories, too much fat, too much frying, not enough fruit and vegetables. And so that's an area that we really want to understand more. And I, I'm skipping uh, agriculture, and I just want to finish with talking about the fact that there are all of those city initiatives that are, there's a lot going on in, in urban issues and discussions and partnerships around urban issues. Um, but what we find is that there are very few that are actually starting their, their work or their thinking with the urban poor. So there's a lot of those uh, initiatives that aim at addressing uh, issues of resilience of cities, infrastructure, and, and all of those things. But they fail to consider the urban poor, their diets, their nutrition, their health, their well-being overall, and that's where we fit. I'm not saying um, that you know we we are better or anything. I'm just saying th this work needs to be complemented by people that are starting from from the bottom up, as opposed to we have a city, and and both types of initiatives should really work together because we're very complementary. So that's just the uh, my final slide. Yeah, thank you. Do I, oh, do I stay here? <laughs> Thank you for that presentation. Lots of data to think about. I was uh, thinking about all the ways that my papers no longer make sense and how am I going to change them. <laughs> Why? Uh, for good reason. Okay. That means it's, it's yeah, working. You've learned something. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is time for our audience to ask questions and just for your um, 
information. We have students, we have faculty. We also have uh, community partners in the room who actually work on food systems change in the city of Buffalo. So we have a mix of colleagues yeah. in the room, um, as well as visitors from other parts of the world. So who would like to begin with a question? And I will bring the mic over. Hi there. Um, thank, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Um, my question, I know you touched on a couple specific like campaigns or efforts to, you know, like get rid of the cartoon characters, um, warn people about like nutritional content of food. But in your knowledge, is there, are there examples of rapidly urbanizing places in the world that have done a better job of navigating the evolution of their food system? Like mm -hmm. maybe they've managed to hang on to set, like the healthier elements of their more traditional food ways while moving into mm -hmm. a more modern culture and w ways that we could replicate best practices maybe mm -hmm. in other about to urbanize areas? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I know there are some small countries in, uh, in South Asia maybe that have managed to preserve the interest and the appetite for their traditional food, but it's, it's, not, the general, um, it's not the general status of things. Um, what, uh, what has been, you know, what I have found is that in Latin America, for example, there's been a recognition of the problem so many years ago. I mean, they're, they're in Mexico, they have a really good Institute of Nutrition Research, and they've talked about the fact that, oh, the populations were getting overweight and all that. They waited until they were, their obesity levels were higher than in the U.S. to actually react. And it's not for lack of the researchers to have tried to, to help. So Latin America is on board. There's a lot going on right now there because there's a lot of researchers that are there and that are paying attention to what's going on that, you know, they're changing the, the, the large social protection programs that were distributing whole milk to children that were already overweight. And so now Zoom, they've changed that to, to uh, uh, skim milk. But you know, it happened so late. And so I, and, and in Africa, I can tell you, I keep talking about it, the fact that we're working in Africa and we're trying to bring up this issue. And we always get, yeah, but we have so much poverty and food insecurity. We can't work on overweight and obesity and they, they really, push back and they, they say, no, but people still buy in the market. Yes, I know they still buy in the market, but it's happening, it's gonna happen. It, in, in t I, will, I hope I'm still around in 10 years to say, I told you, I, I mean, it, and in, in Egypt was a good example where we, we went to visit the minister that had this, um, this kind of subsidy program. He was, the, the, so the, the subsidy, was, they were subsidizing oil uh, sugar, tea, uh, and bread, bread flour, etc. And we were saying, well, look, your country is, is, is showing real signs of, of a lot of problems of overweight and obesity and stunting as well. And so, you know, you should really think about what to do about this. And he said, no, no, I just want to change my transfer program, so my, my subsidy program, so that it's cheaper. But it's too expensive right now. You know, they were covering the whole country. There was no targeting or anything. And so I want something cheaper, but I, you know, I don't care about changing the food. And everybody wants their bread. They need their bread. So, you know, it is not very easy to prevent it from happening. It looks like countries react only once the damage is really done. China tried a bit, but they're in bad shape. And I'm sorry, but there are no examples from developed countries also that they can use. <laughs> Thank you, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I had a question, or I wanted to hear more about your thoughts on how we could use supermarkets. Mm -hmm. um, we, are you envisioning um, partnerships between supermarkets and community groups? I mean, I, it's mm -hmm. a great idea because yeah. people all come to the supermarket yeah. and congregate there. So what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on using supermarkets to improve health? Yeah, I mean, in, in, um, in, in uh, high-income countries, uh, we can already see that, you know, there, there, are, there are signs. I mean, there is a nutrition education in the supermarket, eat your five colors or things that, that people have managed to do. 
In, in uh, low and middle income countries, I have to say, I'm not sure where to start because those, those are really not people that are willing to talk to us. <laughs> so that's a very good question and I don't have yet enough experience to having tried to uh, be able to answer your questions because do these groups even exist that we could work right. with that yeah so and it's a very good question but I'm, I'm not a sure idea. yeah and and uh, I mean in, Me in Mexico again the, this example of the the soda uh, that, that's mixed up with the vegetable you know they, they, they put the soda with the fruit and vegetable as if it was the same thing you know Eat an orange or drink a Coke, you know, it's the same thing. And, um, and I think it's, it's a good example that the Research Institute is the one that documented that, that noticed that, because it's not like that in the high-income supermarkets, it's like that in the low-income markets. And they've identified that this is really a problem, and I don't know if they will be able to work on, on, on eliminating it. So it, it's a good question. Thank you so much, Marie. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm wondering if you could speak to whether there have been specific interventions that deals with the culture of poverty and then the culture of money and then wealth. Mm. So I'm thinking specifically to the issue of overweight. overweight. Mm -hmm. And there's this culture that if you are well to do it and you are rich, you're supposed to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. So having a man having a pot belly is a sign of richness. Oh, I know. A child have it. So is there a specific <laughs> intervention that yeah. looks at the culture? And especially, I'm also thinking about supermarket. Shopping in supermarket is seen as a sign of wealth. Yeah, yeah. And so is there a specific intervention that can deal with that culture mm -hmm. of eating? And yeah, uh, this is a very uh, good question. And I, I think uh, I've mentioned to some of you uh, today <laughs> that I started working on urban issues in 1990, 2000, in the early 2000, and uh, we did work in Ghana, and um, we, um, we had a lot of presentations, and you know, we tried to promote this work, we tried to also promote this work among government, I mean, to get the governments to uh, see the need for it, and also the donors and everything. And uh, we were constantly getting this, this point, you know, that uh, health, health is reflected in, in a large-ish body size. And, um, and then came the, you know, the, the uh, HIV problem, and so that was even more, you know, if you have a thin, thin wife, she's, she's, you know, she's anorexic or uh, has HIV. And so um, it is a very real problem, and the, the issue in Egypt was, was like that too, and we were trying to talk about the, the, the problem. So, um, again, I, I, I have not seen that we are successful in changing that. The only place where I've been incredibly impressed is, is Senegal, where, um, for those of you who know Senegal, there's a corniche, uh, which is right along the, the, the ocean. I mean, it's a beautiful place. And they've set up a jogging place, you know what I mean? So you can go along, there are, the cars are in their cars, <laughs> the, the cars are in the streets, and then you have a beautiful place where you can just run and jog, and people do it, and not just men. And, I, and I've been there, and I'm walking, because I don't jog, and people are saying, why aren't you running, run, run, run? You know what I mean? There's really this wonderful atmosphere of a country where it's not about how fat you are only, you know, it's about how fit you are. And, and so, um, but you know, this is a point, you know, the area of, of Dakar that's pretty wealthy. And so those who, who run are not the poorest of the poor, but uh, at least there's an example of, and, and I know that Mexico has now done that on, on Sundays now, they close their, I don't know what big carretera they have, their main big street, and it's for exercising, for bicycling, for, for running. And um, so I think we need to, to kind of, we can't just put all the blame on food, and we need to also recognize that, you know, if people exercise more, they would be much less likely to have all of these bad consequences of being overweight and obese. Thank you for responding. I'll come back to a question. We are also live casting this, which I forgot to mention to the audience here. So we have questions coming in from people who are listening oh, remotely okay. from mm -hmm. other partner countries. 
And we have a question here that is a nice supplement to the question that Emmanuel raised, uh, which has to do with um, the context in which you conduct your work. And the question is, are there any areas where the perception of beauty and cultural practice has resulted in increase in weight and high calorie diets? Mm -hmm. Has that been documented? And um, could you speak a bit yeah. more about that? Yeah, I, I actually don't, as I said, I don't know if it's, it's in writing, if it's documented, but it's known, it's very well known because we, yeah, inevitably, you see, we, we got two people asking pretty much the same question and um, and I I don't know how, for example, you can educate people about what's a healthy weight, and not everybody looks the same with a healthy weight. And you know, I haven't seen, or, or I mean, you're coming from Africa. Have you seen people actually talk about it? Are there? Uh, does it take you know people talking in communities and trying to? You, you can't kill taboos like that. You know, it's it's. Uh, it's a really difficult one, um, but if, if um, I think if there is a, a movement for people, as I said, to exercise more and to, to try to be more conscious about, about good, good nutrition and good diets, then they will see that these people will start looking different and, and they will maybe understand that you don't need to be so fat to be healthy. But I, I, I haven't seen anything in writing about what to do about it. So perhaps this is a, a possibility for more transdisciplinary work mm -hmm. yeah. engaging colleagues in cultural anthropology mm -hmm. or other yeah. fields who do pay a lot of attention yeah. to um, questions of culture. Yeah, yeah that's so great. So we have a mm -hmm. question, I think, from Alex. Um, thank you. I'm especially interested in um, when you spoke about the correlation between obesity and still being malnutrition. Um, I have not experienced that conversation going on to any degree, and I know that it's an issue. Have you, do you have any examples of food systems or areas around the world that are addressing that in, in a systematic way and having any success with it? Um, and, and I'm not sure if you mean uh, within an individual? The relationship between uh, yes yes uh, so there is um, there is uh, uh, quite a bit of literature and, and the literature is rapidly changing on um, the relationship between nutrition during early life and later um, well-being and. Um, so we have this concept of the first thousand days, the pregnancy, the period during pregnancy plus the first two years of the child are a period where we get completely programmed in terms of how efficient we are at managing our calories and, and whether you, know, you eat a calorie and it goes into fat or it goes into... Um, and, um, and there's increasing evidence that those first thousand days are extremely important and if you're malnourished during that period you are more at risk of becoming overweight and obese later on in life and actually much younger than in other areas or among people that are not malnourished during early life. So there, that evidence is there um, and so you're more susceptible but you're more susceptible if you're exposed to an obesogenic environment and that's what happens in a lot of countries that those population Mexico with everybody was malnourished when they were young and in the space of 10 years the whole environment became incredib incredibly obesogenic so people are eating too much and then they can't uh, um, they can't deal with it so they get obese and then ob obesity is now hypothesized to be, or, or abdomen, abdominal fat is hypothesized to be more toxic for those people who suffered from early malnutrition in the sense that obesity is more likely to transfer and to translate into diabetes and, and cardiovascular diseases. And so the link between obesity and chronic diseases is not automatic for everybody. If you're obese, you're gonna have all these chronic diseases. But for those who suffered from malnutrition during early life, it's more a direct, um, equation. And to me, all of this explains why Latin America became so overweight and obese so quickly. And, and why in India, uh, the, I think India is the second country uh, with the highest 
number of diabetic people. And that's because probably they've been, expo they've been malnourished during early childhood and then they're exposed to all this sugar and their, their pancreas is not able to produce the amount of insulin they need to deal with it. So there, there's really biological factors that I, I find we need to be very careful with. And on, on that, this is why we now say we need to deal with malnutrition in all its form simultaneously. And I've been involved in, in a series on the double burden of malnutrition where Corinna Hawks and I are, have worked on a paper on double duty actions. That is, when we target interventions that aim at addressing undernutrition, we need to not forget that those could lead to overnutrition later in life. And so we've seen programs where kids are, are overfed when they're young because they're, they're, they're too small and they're not growing well, and so they, they gain weight rapidly. And, and rapid weight gain in early childhood is associated with more risk of obesity as well later on. So it's not, so you know, your impact when you're, so we're talking now, as what I was thinking about double duty actions, actions that are targeting all forms of malnutrition at the same time, or that are keeping in mind that if you overfeed that child for one reason or another right now, you have to be careful about the foods you give that child to make him grow better rather than just give whatever food, because that child might be more at risk later in life. And so there is this new thing about double duty actions that I think will become um, uh, part of, WHO is involved in that series, and, and we're all going to be promoting that whatever large programs that we're implementing. For, I, we have example, we have an example of the, the Progresa program in Mexico that was targeting very food insecure families and they were giving cash and, and, and all sorts of things. And the kids uh, did better in terms of, of early or child malnutrition and the moms got obese. And there's several examples from Latin America of, of social protection programs targeted to poverty and food insecurity that have made, uh, that have had negative effects on, on overweight and obesity or, or blood pressure or these, these other things. So we, those programs would have had to think about, okay, there's a stunted child here, but there's all these overweight moms. How do we design this program so that it doesn't do harm on one side of that picture? Interesting. So we have a question here. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question about, and this might be a little difficult, but um, <laughs> uh, the role Thanks. of in some of these agreements and these um, policy goals that you've outlined, um, the engagement with, with the corporate sector, and as you said, mm -hmm. kind of making them involved. Yeah. Um, as you said, I think that life course perspective is so important um, as far as mm -hmm. the issues affecting people over the life course, mm -hmm. because advertising also occurs over the life course, as you know, so they're targeting um, people from birth, so yeah. there's mm -hmm. been a lot of so Nestle and these groups will convince mothers that, they're, yeah. that the infant formula is better yeah, for their yeah. babies than their breast milk. Mm -hmm. And then Nestle is producing these things that are, you know, targeting children and targeting yeah. teenagers and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, what, what do you think about that? And <laughs> what do you think yeah. um, is being done or any like success stories that have occurred up till now? Um, yeah, it, it is an incredibly touchy topic because it's very hard to trust the industry. It's, it's incredibly hard because they fool us all the time. I mean, we think some companies look really good and on paper and then, you know, I go to Burkina Faso in a very remote place and I find an infant cereal where they say to be consumed between four months and 24 months and I'm sorry, no, not before six months and, you know, you still find those things. And so whatever they say that Nestle is, is, is changing things, I will not believe it. I mean, uh, we have a, a lot of, of, of problems like that. And we do a lot of, you know, whenever we work with the private sector, we have to do a very complete uh, due diligence to review their practices. This happens uh, in agriculture as well as in, in, in food, of course. Um, and I, uh, you know, no, I, I don't have a solution. I, I think I have even more other examples of, of things that, that I don't trust. For example, the, there's a big uh, focus now on reformulation because we're all criticizing they're too high in sugar and fat and, and, and they don't have enough protein or micronutrients. They're just going to, as I mentioned before, they're just going to add those. 
oh, they put a, a, a powder that has protein in it, and they're put the micronutrients and it'll be fortified. It will, so they will have health claims on those things. Um, I don't believe in the reformulation. I, I believe in dropping, dropping, dropping all of these things. But you know, that's a little radical, and nobody wants their Mars bars or their <laughs> sucaritas to go away. <laughs> so thanks for the question, <coughs> but it's a long, long debate. There's a question here, and then I'll come back. <coughs> Thank you. So my question is following up on your comments about Progresa. I know your team does a lot of evaluations around social protection yes. and evaluating those for food security and nutrition. And increasingly we're seeing in Africa that a lot of these social protection programs mm -hmm. that started out in rural areas and are really, some of the objectives include stunting, are trying to expand into urban areas mm -hmm. now. And so I'm wondering if your team is doing any work linking some of these social protection programs with some of the food systems work that mm -hmm. you're all doing. We haven't yet, but uh, you're right, this is one of our, especially my division's uh, main uh, uh, research, big research portfolio is, is to look specifically at programs and where they fit. And what we've found over the years is that there used to be more social protection programs in urban areas because that's where the countries had their voters. And, and so people were targeted and, and uh, and, and we're more likely to receive um, um, social protection programs in urban areas. And now, interestingly, it's the opposite. The urban areas have been abandoned from uh, a lot of the, the same countries where, where they used to be prominent. And um, we're actually working in Bangladesh. Uh, we're going to be doing a survey in urban areas to inform what are the needs of, of the people in urban areas for social protection. But we haven't done the link that you're saying with, with food systems, and we're very interested in, in making it. Uh, when we say that the diets are too expensive, that they can't afford a healthy diet, we really believe that. And we believe that this is where social protection will fit in. But social protection alone will make them spend on the wrong thing. So we need social protection with behavior change, with really a lot of education about diets. And, and so we're, we're planning to look for opportunities to do that. You may be doing it together. You don't know yeah. this yet, and but we that's part of the plan. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Rue. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, my question is on the gender issue. Mm -hmm. So in most countries, culturally or generally, it's the woman's job to take care of the child in mm -hmm. food preparation and all that. Um, so when you say that um, women go to work or women go outside the house to work mm -hmm. or, I don't know, collect water maybe. Um, so they have less time to actually take care of the mm -hmm. kid or um, to prepare food in an adequate way. Um, what are your thoughts or ideas on how to tackle malnutrition while not undermining the gender equality um, work that's being done in such areas? I, I don't see the dichotomy here. Tackling who's malnutrition? Um, both the of mother the and the, the child, mother. yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't understand your question. Because Are you saying that we're not uh, dealing with the gender issue? No, no, or? I'm asking yeah, about how? your ideas and thoughts of how to tackle malnutrition, but at the same time, ensuring that gender equality mm -hmm. work keeps going on. Oh, and okay. Well, and we do that a lot. I'm not the expert in gender. I have uh, my own guru in my division. Agnes Kisumbing, who, uh, who has been leading incredible work in, on gender uh, and women's empowerment. And uh, we have uh, worked a lot in Bangladesh, among other places, because there's a demand. We, I don't know if you know about the Women's Empowerment Index. Yeah, so the Women's Empowerment Index has been um, a way for a lot of countries to figure out that they had a problem with women's empowerment, because we now developed an index that is used in different countries to measure the level of empowerment of women, but also in different domains. And so we, we find that in Bangladesh, uh, who, which, which was one of the first countries where we used this index for a nationally representative survey, and we provided and, and, and discussed the data a lot with the government, um, they, were, they were shocked. You know, they <laughs> there's a lot of men in the government, but they, they did not understand, they did not know that women were, uh, were disempowered in these aspects and all of that. So. They took the information and they said, okay, we're going to implement an agriculture program uh, and we want it to be gender 
sensitive. We want to improve women's empowerment through this app because women work in agriculture and we want the women to be empowered. And we also know from your result that empowering women leads to better child nutrition. So there was a demand following, following that, that the first results that we had, there was a demand for testing different approaches to empower women in agriculture. And so we, um, we work with uh, the implementers and we design uh, some, you know, community groups with women where you discuss all sorts of things and also you put uh, some of the benefits, some of the, for example, the, if they get inputs for agriculture, you put them in the hands of the women or if they get some cash as, uh, in, in some programs, they go in the hands of the women. And then we test also where we try to change community norms, where, where we don't just try to empower women, but we try to empower women and, and get the community's and endorsement, the community's and the men's endorsement. And, and we looked at impact on women's empowerment. And, and of course, the package where you had everything was a lot more powerful than the package where you're just trying to tell women, oh, you have to go more outside. You have to be more autonomous. You have to... Um, Yeah. Right? In certain areas, women may not be allowed. No, allowed. but that's that's when you need to change the norms, and and the way to change the norms is not by just focusing on women; is by focusing on the communities, and uh, and that's why it was it had more impact because by convincing the husbands and the grandparents and and the whole community, then these women became more. Uh, able to do these things. So it, it will depend on the culture. I know, le I know much less about women's empowerment in Africa than I, I do about South Asia, but uh, we have worked with people that are very committed in, in Bangladesh and in India in, in testing out different, uh, different approaches to empower women in, in different domains. And with the women's empowerment as a baseline with that index, we know what are the areas where they need to be more empowered. And, and, and we have quite a few examples of success in, in Positive impact. One last question <laughs> from the back, and then we have to wrap up, but there'll be other opportunities. Um, I was interested in the policy and research agenda that you listed at the end of the presentation, and if you could talk a little bit more about your plan for implementing that agenda. Is this mm -hmm. mostly internal research, or are you partnering with other researchers, no. or <laughs> what, your, what your feelings are? Yeah, that's the reason why I'm here. Um, so basically, uh, we started that uh, in 2018, and since then we are doing uh, different projects in different countries of relatively small scale, except one that is a larger one in, in Ghana. But uh, we're actively fundraising for the work. Uh, I keep saying we are expensive. We, we're not professors uh, at the university. We, are, we have to put our salaries in all of our uh, budgets. And so it's, it's a process for us to generate enough funding to be able to actually populate this uh, nice research agenda. And uh, we're looking for partners, for partners to work pr on proposals with, for partners to work with, for partners that might be implementing something that we could come in and evaluate or work with them. Uh, we're also working to learn. Um, things have changed so much. As I said, I worked on this in 1999 and, and, uh, and a little bit into the 2000. And things have changed completely in terms of what the food environments look like. And so I'm at a loss with the methods now to analyze food environments. And, and we discussed that this morning a lot. How, what are the tools that exist and, and how do we use them and how do we make sense of them? And so we definitely can't do it alone. I mean, it is rich in terms of, of uh, uh, having a lot of excellent researchers, but nobody has the kind of experience and we all need to learn together. So I'm here to, that's why I chose to present the program also to get people interested and, and <laughs> to see who's interested in what aspects of it. And I've just been here for less, for yeah, 20, 24 hours and I've already, <laughs> I already have lots of ideas, so. So that's, that's a, a perfect segue to yeah. bring this to a close. As uh, Dr. Well mentioned, it's an opportunity for a UB community for global health equity and its affiliates to explore partnerships and projects with IFPRI. And of course, um, Kasia Cordes and I are here to facilitate those conversations. We have contact information that we're happy to pass on. Um, Dr. Well is already aware that there are colleagues at UB that are working on food equity, not just faculty, but also students. 
um, and community partners. So this is just what I hope is the beginning of a much longer mm -hmm. conversation. Thank you for coming here, and please join me in thanking Dr. Marie Joel for Thank you. Being here.